Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Parenting Aces Radio Show presented by TennisBalls.com on Blog Talk Radio's You Are Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we are talking today with Peter Rennert. Peter is the founder and CEO of Telos, which is the Effortless Life Operating System, Telos. And Peter is a coach, but he's not your typical tennis coach. And when I bring him on the air and he starts talking, you'll understand what I mean by that. And uh, it's a positive thing. I had the pleasure of meeting Peter for the first time at a college coaches showcase down in Florida when my son was in high school. And um, Peter was there and, and we chatted for a long time. And uh, we've since run into each other at other events, uh, college matches and other tennis events around the country and have stayed in touch. And, and I'm just so excited that he's able to take some time out and chat with us today about Telos, about his coaching philosophy and about how he can help our kids and help us as parents do a better job. So let me go ahead and get him on the line and we're going to jump right in. Peter, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. So I, I describe you as a coach, but but an atypical coach. Um, that's pretty accurate, right? Yeah, I would say that's very accurate. <laughs> Um, you're not the guy to go to for a beginner who needs to learn proper grips and how to hit a forehand and how to hit a backhand, or are you that guy? Uh, well, I can be that guy, but that's not actually where my passion and my interests lie. So um, I've chosen to focus more in the area uh, that matters most to me, and I've I have relationships with lots of people uh, and other teaching pros uh, who that is their passion and that's their area of expertise. And uh, I shied away from it just because I don't really feel there is a, a right grip or a right stroke or a right, you know, a specific technique that is the right thing. Uh, and I mean, I only have to look at Indian Wells this week and look at all the different ways uh, people in the top 100 in the world are hitting the ball. And there are a lot of differences. There are some things that are pretty consistent. And, uh, you know, for those things, there are people who are really, really uh, passionate about teaching those things. And that's not your area. So... No. What I what I like to do with my guests when when they're coming on my show for the first time is um, just ask you to give a little bit of background on your life in tennis, how you got started in the sport, and you know maybe some highlights of of your playing career, and then talk about how you got into coaching and more specifically, you know what led you down this path with Telos. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, I come from a tennis playing family, uh, not tournament playing, but everybody played. My brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, and we'd go down to the public parks and uh, hit balls. And there were five of us, so I often had to wait my turn because I was the youngest. Uh, I guess that made me a little hungrier. And uh, I started playing tournaments probably about the age of 11 or 12. Uh, yeah, I played junior camp matches and things like that when I was a little younger, but, uh, I know as far as tennis goes, when I picked up a racket and put it in my hand and played, I was athletic. I liked to be outdoors. I liked to run around. I liked to hit a ball and I liked that all the adults would whisper and go, how old is that boy? Uh, you see that kid. And so the attention I got, uh, also was a motivator. Uh, and, uh, then I went through the sort of the junior circuit I met. Uh, I played John McEnroe at the age of 11. He was my first tournament match in a, uh, Eastern Lawn Tennis Association, I guess the ETA or Eastern Tennis Association. Um, he won that one and many more after <laughs> that. <laughs> but I got closer Good to know. and closer as time unfolded. It started off 6-3-6-love six, six, and 
by the 16s, it was like six four seven six, And then that first year, 18s, it was, uh, I was taking sets and we were going three sets. And then I went off to Junior Davis Cup and John went off to Junior Wimbledon. And then he ended up qualifying for Wimbledon. And I went undefeated at Junior Davis Cup and he got to the semifinals at Wimbledon. So he was a little tougher to catch after that. Uh, but, uh, I kept, uh, I kept going and playing and I went to Stanford, uh, university, uh, I was top 10 in the country. I don't remember the exact number, but I know I was in the top 10, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, I, that was a year of title nine introduction. So all the college tennis teams went from eight scholarships to five on the men's side. And so there were three of us. I was recruited by Stanford, but I was not, I did not get a scholarship. Uh, there were three of us who were sort of looking at the five, six, seven spot. Um, and college tennis was wait, really. Wait, 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 wait. You're number 10 in the country and you're fighting at the bottom of the lineup for a spot? Yeah, yeah. When, we, I, when, I, when I arrived, wow. what I was told was actually the three of us, three freshmen coming in, that the first four spots were not available for challenge matches, that we would play challenge matches with everybody else. And, you know, at best, the best we could possibly hope for was to be number five. Wow. Yeah. Well, you almost had an amazing team. I mean, I had team. a big choice. I, was, <laughs> I had full scholarship. What's that? I said you almost have had an amazing team. We did have a pretty good team. That's true, actually. But it also, <laughs> I had a choice then. There was a big choice there at that point uh, because I was offered full scholarships to pretty much every school in the country except for UCLA, USC, and Stanford. And, you know, much to my parents' chagrin, those were the only three that really interested me, uh, partly because of warm weather being outdoors, partly because of the quality of the tennis program. And then I went and visited all three schools, and clearly Stanford was the best fit for me in many ways, just the the environment and the landscape and the architecture, uh, the uh, everything about it, and the fact that the coach there really Dick Gould, uh, he did a good job of making me feel very very wanted. Whereas the other two coaches said I'd be a great asset, and you know I might make the team, I might not. Uh, coach Gould made it made me feel like the, there was a spot for me there, even though I wasn't getting a scholarship. So. I ended up. What a good uh, man! Yeah, uh, it, it worked out well. So I ended up going there technically as a walk-on, and I won all my challenge matches in the fall of that first year. Um, and so I was the number five guy. And then we went off for winter break and we played tournaments. And when we came back, coach decided that we should have another round of challenge matches. Uh, and that time. I lost uh, the two matches and I ended up number seven from number five. Uh, I was not happy about having to play those challenge matches at all, uh, which didn't help me play them well. And so now I was seven doubles. I was always very strong. So I was third doubles and seven singles, which meant I traveled with the team, but I didn't play singles my freshman year. Uh, and uh, that was tough because the way it works there is like you get the cot when three guys, three freshmen are in a room, there's two beds and a cot. And if you're number seven, you get the cot. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, I came back the next year and we had the exact same team. No one graduated. Plus John had decided to come to Stanford that year as well. So technically I was now number eight and not part of the traveling team. And we had the same set up we did all the fall challenge matches and i went undefeated again in the fall challenge matches making me think fall was probably a good time for me because <laughs> i always did very well <laughs> in those challenge matches but winning all those just made me number six uh and then we had the came back after winter break and coach had that next set of challenge matches and i had to play a match where if i had lost the match I would have been seven and then I would have had to play another match. And if I lost that match, I would be number eight. And that would mean I did not travel. So I basically had one match for whether or not I was going to continue to be, you know, on the, on the traveling team, which in essence meant my career. So, uh, I ended up winning that match, um, and ended up being the number six guy. And then it turned out the number five guy, 
lost his first like uh, lost a lot of dual matches and i went from number six they switched us put number five at six and i moved to five uh and then when we got to the ncaa's the number four guy hurt his knee and i ended up playing number four and we played ucla in the finals and i ended up clinching the team championship at number four upsetting a guy named bruce nichols who was um highly regarded college player at that time and i was not supposed to win that match which ended our Stanford season. We went undefeated 24 and 0 and uh, it was a pretty good college season. John went on to win the individual as well that year. And then when I came back my junior year, unbe- sort of like, I just didn't figure it out. I don't know how I didn't figure it out, but the three people in front of me, two of them graduated one turn pro. And I was now the number one player on the number one team in the country and eight months ago, I had played a match for whether or not I would make the team. Wow. Yeah. So uh, things can change. You know, I mean, that's like, you know, I look back and go, wow, a lot happened in that short period of time. And I didn't really feel like I was the number one player. That was an odd feeling. I didn't feel I deserved it or was qualified. And my first match at number one, I had to play Kevin Curran, who was number one in the country, I think, at the time. And I lost the first set, I think six love or six one. And I was down three love, one break in the second. And I, I don't know, something inside me, I just got, I got mad. And uh, when I got mad, I was, I decided that, um, you know, I'm going to hold my serve. You know, and then when I held my serve, I thought, all right, now one break and I'm back in the match. And somehow I went on to win that match. And after I won that match, I was like, wow, maybe I do. Maybe I do belong at number one. And, uh, you know, it's from there, then I was number one that whole year and had a really good year, junior year. And that was the only year we didn't win the team event. We got upset in the semifinals. My freshman and sophomore year, we won the team event. Junior year, we came in third place uh, and had chances. I had match points uh, uh, to win my match in the semis. And then my senior year, I ended up, we won the team thing. I think we went undefeated. And I was the number one player in the country and the number one college ranked player in America and the second highest ranked amateur ever in college behind John. Um, so I was you know, two in the country and two in my neighborhood because we lived right near each other. Uh, uh, and then, you know, that, and while I was in college, my going into my senior year, uh, I said they had what are the equivalent of futures and challengers tournaments then, and I played some, and I was always very good at doubles, uh, or more relaxed, I think, at doubles. I, I, I just enjoyed doubles. I liked having someone on the court with me. The camaraderie of that was really um, enjoyable. And so I did well. And we played these tournaments that summer. Kevin and I played together, and we won three pro tournaments in a row and didn't lose more than two games in a set. And I looked up after five weeks and we had been the finals five weeks in a row and I was ranked 60 in the world in doubles. And I have no idea how that we were going to tournaments, choosing who was going to sleep in the back seat or the front seat. Cause we at that point couldn't afford, you know, the hotel rooms. So it was a rather remarkable, surprising time. And then I, from there, I went back to college and played a few of the challengers and the confidence I got from winning matches and doubles moved over into singles. And I, I, I won a challenger. I got to the finals of a challenger. Uh, and then I went to Australia and I got to the quarterfinals of the Australian open. And then I was ranked 39 in the world and I was still in college. Uh, so amazing at that, at that point, I figured I was going to actually make a living, which was good because I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to it. <laughs> Even though I went to Stanford because I knew I was getting a good education, uh, in the back of my mind, I just really liked playing tennis, and and that's what I did. That's amazing. And so, so hopefully that'll get after both to you, all those college players out there, juniors. Yeah. Go ahead. So after college, then what? After co- after college, I went on the pro tour, and my first year did really well. I stayed around 40 in the world. I got to the quarters of the Australian Open again. I beat lots of big names who were top 10 in the world, Brian Godfrey, Johan Creek, Kevin Curran, Mats Vlander. Um, and uh, and then, the, then the second year, I had my first injury. I tore my tricep the second year before I was just before Wimbledon. 
Uh, I had had a great match with Bjorn Borg in my first year as a pro where the only reason I lost was because it never occurred to me that I could win. Because as I was playing him, he didn't really play lefties. I mean, in my opinion, in that match, he wasn't playing a smart match to beat me. He was pretty stubborn, I guess, because he was one in the world. He felt like he could do what he did and it would work. But I had set points to win the first set, won the second set. This was up in Canada. And then ended up losing a break in the third, but just really because it never occurred to me that I could win. After that, I actually felt like if I played Bjorn again, that I would win. And then my second year as a pro, I drew Bjorn first round at Wimbledon, but 10 days before that, I tore my tricep uh, in the quarterfinals of Queens Club in the singles match. And unfortunately was not phys- I ended up playing the match, but I didn't pick up a racket for 10 days and walked on center court. And, uh, I couldn't after I could only slice a backhand. I couldn't hit over cause of the pain. And then my go- my, my, uh, my plan was I'm going to win the first set and then I'm going to default that way. Everybody can, would know I could win that match, but I ended up, I had lots of break points and chances to win the first set, lost it in a tiebreaker. And then I thought, well, you can't, you can't default now because that'll look like, you know, that wouldn't look good. So Bjorn went on to beat me again, two out of two. Uh, and I was injured for the first time. And then that injury, I came back from that, but I never really recovered fully. I mean, I recovered. I ended up getting back up to top 10 in the world in doubles and winning three pro tournaments and, and doing well on the tour. I ended up starting having nagging little a- aggravations and injuries that I was, I was always dealing with being physically, uh, you know, something was hurting. And then I was playing a match in Italy and there was a court that the court was kind of uneven. And I went to plant, I was running hard to my left. I went to plant, push off and go back to the middle. And I hyperextended my leg cause the court had like a little dip and I felt a pain shoot up my leg and I ended up, Basically, I had sciatic. I ended up with sciatica on both sides of my body, and I still played for like another year. And you know, I did whatever it is. You know, I I basically told the guys get me back on the court because uh, that's what I knew. Uh, do whatever I have to do to mm. perform. It's only a couple hours, and uh, and I finally, at the age of 24, just short of my 25th birthday, I had to retire because I was slowly descending. Um, you know, down the rankings, things, everything was getting worse and worse. And I was in pain and I, I had to make a decision. Um, uh, and I did, you know, the yeah. decision was, do, do I want to walk without pain when I'm 40? Uh, or do I want to try and tough out another year or two on the tour uh, where I was not happy anymore? And, and? I... Yeah, I chose, I, 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 you know, I had the wherewithal at the age of 24 to say, you know what, when I'm 40, I don't want to be limping around and talking about, you know, the glory days as Bruce Springsteen would say it. So, uh, I sort of, I just sort of disappeared from the tour, which the odd thing is in the world of tennis, which is hierarchical, hierarchical, that no matter who you're standing next to, they're probably someone better than you and someone worse than you. And, uh, you know, so I at 40 in the world, I was considered a journeyman. And if you asked me if I was a great tennis player, I would have said, well, yeah, I'm okay. Cause there would have been probably somebody standing next to me who's top 20. So it didn't, it wouldn't appear accurate. You know, I, you know, it was like, know your place at 40, you're a journeyman. Uh, so that was the thinking, you know, that, that, that was uh, my thinking anyway, which you know, didn't help me. Um, so I decided, you know, it was in my body. I needed to figure out my body had, in my mind at that time, my body had failed me and I needed to figure out like what happened. Uh, why did my body break down? Um, and that adventure is what is the uh, essence of Telos or telos really can be pronounced either way. Uh, and it's an acronym for the effortless life operating system, T E L O S for 20 years. I called what I did effortless. And and so my website was effortlessliving.com, which was really long. And as I began to teach 
what you know my approach people kept telling me that really it's a life operating system and i didn't know what that meant until i got a new iphone and I, they told me that they had to put in a new operating system and i was like oh what's an operating system which essentially it's a philosophy um uh, and I, I suddenly understood that when, oh, I wonder if like effortless life operating system is available on, uh, as a URL. So I went and looked it up and it said, no, it's taken. Then I thought, well, it's the, it's the effortless life op- operating system. I wonder if TELOS is available. And at the time I didn't know, is it, how would I pronounce that? Telos or Telos? And it didn't matter. They both, I liked them both. And I liked that there was like no meaning to the word uh, and that it was shorter. So I looked it up and they said, telos.com is not available, but telos.today is available. And I went, oh, wow. Well, that's, that's even better. Uh, you know, so cause that's, <laughs> you know, that fits what I'm doing to a T. So that felt like a little sign from the universe of affirmation. Um, and then I found out a couple of weeks later, I was out with someone who informed me that telos actually is a word. It's a Greek word from Aristotle, and it means ultimate purpose, which again is exactly what I do, which I'll explain shortly. But so it was another affirmation like, okay, this is the correct name, and this is what I will call what I do from here on in. Uh, so, so that's say the story it again, about because you got. It cut you off a little bit. So telos from the Greek means what? Ultimate purpose. Ultimate purpose. Ultimate purpose. Got it. And Got it. Okay. Supposedly, it's from the Greek root of telesteel, which someone else told me who studies that um, Jesus' last words on the cross were, I am finished. And it was from the words, Telesteel. I don't know if that's part of true. That's not my area of expertise. But there was a lot of really positive energy around the word telos or telos in terms of what I do, because what I ultimately what I do is help people to clarify and fulfill their purpose. Uh, so ultimate purpose being the meaning of the word seemed pretty apropos. Yeah. Which seems a long way from tennis, but we're going to segue back to tennis now. Okay, um, so let's do that. This is a good opportunity for that. So um, you're retired from the tour. Your body has let you down, and you're 24 years old. So Yeah. Well, hindsight, my body didn't let me down at all. Uh, hindsight, my mind drove my body into the ground in order to accomplish stuff. Because my body had been speaking to me all along the way, and I did not pay attention to any of the yellow lights, to any of the blinking yellow lights, to any of the red lights, the blinking red light. I didn't pay attention until I could not walk without pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Up until that point, my mind told my body to dig in, be a man, get tough, push through, do one more, all the cultural things that I was taught to do. And uh, I didn't realize that at the time, but I realize it now. And, And it's the reason I do what I do, that the number one most important thing that I think our children need to learn and the adults as well, but I I focus much more on the kids is how to get their mind and their body to work together in harmony to get stuff done. And whatever that stuff is, Peter, (laughs) it is unbelievably simple. And by paying attention to that one thing, for the last 28 years, I developed, I ended up developing an entire curriculum and exercises and techniques and tools, all these different things so that in that simple form again, that basically first I will teach you how to connect your mind and your body 
to work together in harmony, and it's extraordinarily simple. And then second, help you to become aware of when your mind and your body are separating. And then third, give you the tools to get them to get back together. That's it. So... the word that best describes what I do is sustainable. So for me now, excellence is not enough. Sustainable excellence is the top priority. And I can help connect the dots and create awareness around all the choices that we make that are unsustainable. And we are being taught unsustainability in, I would say, 99.9% perhaps more of the sports programs in this country and in other countries. And can you, can you give an example of what, what that means? An unsustainable. Yes. Um, goal or yeah. Yeah. So sustainability, I'm going to, and remember to ask me the question again, after I give you this first part of the answer. Okay. Okay. Would you do that for me? So (laughs) sustainable, the body and the mind working together in harmony makes it sustainable. If the body, if the mind is driving the body, it's unsustainable. So in order to do that, the first step is that I do is to create an optimal learning environment. What is an optimal learning environment? Optimal learning environment is first and foremost that we feel cared for and that we feel safe. Even though those should be given, there are some programs out there that are abusive and kids don't feel safe or don't feel cared for. So if, if you don't feel cared for or don't feel safe, I would highly recommend leaving whatever program you're in, no matter how well touted it is, no matter how famous the person running it is, no matter what. That's like, to me, that's, you know, unyielding for sustainability um, and optimal learning. The third thing is progressions, clear progressions. There needs to be a path of progressions that you can follow. And the last thing is that the body and the mind are working together in harmony to fulfill those progressions. So what it looks like is you establish uh, body, mind, harmony. I put body first now instead of mind, body, harmony. Everybody talks about mind, body. The mind is so busy running the show that I've switched it and given the body. I want the body to have an equal voice, so I put the body first. Body, mind, harmony. Um, So what it looks like is... uh, Trying to think of a really clear and easy example to digest. Okay. See, I'll give you a story about just on a court and then I'll give you like one or two of the tools to explain it. So the foundation, okay. uh, relaxation is the foundation of optimal learning um, to be uh, fully relaxed and fully engaged, the mind and the body working together in harmony. So to establish that, a simple thing to do is that when we breathe, there is a pause or a space between both parts of the breathing cycle, after you exhale, after we exhale, before we inhale, there's a pause where the breath changes direction, a space. And it can be very big or it can be not there at all. So if I'm panting, there's no space at all. Okay? Right. And if there's no space at all, I'm going to engage my fight or flight nervous system and I'm going to produce adrenaline, and I'm going to produce cortisol and a bunch of other chemicals that have a degenerative effect on the body over the long term, not from one time, but if that's how I practice every day, uh, it will have a degenerative effect. But I'm in that moment, it's an emergency. And the emergency is, I don't have enough oxygen. I need oxygen. And the body is going to prioritize cognitive function or oxygen. So first step is get the oxygen. Uh, um, That's if I don't have the space. Well, when I have the space, the body's relaxed. 
when I have that natural pause and anyone can find it if they want, if they listen to this and they close their eyes and sit in a chair, actually better to lie on the floor and just observe their breath. It's not created by holding my breath. I don't at the end of an exhale, hold my breath to create a space. There's just, there's movement, but it, there's not, I don't inhale right away. And for me now, sometimes, you know, if I'm lying on the ground, it'll be a minute before a minute and a half or two minutes before I have any need to inhale. So the space can be enormous. When I first started doing this, it was like a second, maybe two seconds long. Um, so the space between the breath is the foundation uh, of relaxation. And in a training approach, in a sustainable training approach, I know where I, that's my primary internal monitor, my primary tool to gauge whether I'm going too fast or not. If I get to the point where I'm, I'm panting and I don't have the space, the mind and the body are beginning to separate because there's an emergency. And in the training approach in Telos, the training approach is I want to be aware of when that moment happens. And I want to pause until I recover the space fully and then go forward again. And I just keep doing that over and over and over. And I always get questions around that saying, oh, that's fine. But what are you going to do in a five set match? So if you remember back to optimal learning, there are progressions. And I haven't met anyone who yet who's really, truly in shape or fit enough to play a five set match without having to go into fight or flight many times. But in training and in practice, it is never necessary, nor is it helpful to go there. I don't, I can learn when I go there, if I play a tournament, it's four all in the third and it's 30 all, and we have a really long point and I lose the space between my breath. I can't, you know, stop and tell the guy, look, you know, I'm, I'm not ready. That's conditioning. My conditioning has affected me. But it's important to understand that when we lose the space and we go into fight or flight and we produce adrenaline, we lose fine motor control. And so things that were easy and precise become less precise because we literally are choking. So Meaning that would be the not getting enough oxygen. Yeah, you don't have enough oxygen. That's what choking is. I don't have okay. enough air. So mm -hmm. this is actually why we don't perform well. And I don't, kids haven't necessarily connected the dot on that, nor have adults connected the dot on those two things. And then we try to change our thinking. And I'm often pigeonholed. People think what I do is mental, a mental approach to tennis, but it's not at all. It's actually a body-mind approach. It's both. Uh, you know, if you tell me to relax when I'm uptight, I get extremely irritated because if I could relax, <laughs> I would, but I can't. So all those kids out there who get tight, it'd be a lot better if I, you had a doable, something you could do that would produce relaxation rather than relax. And even the, and everything that we've done in our teaching that I've realized over the years, we're not as precise as we could be in this root and that's, and it gets lost when we're working with someone. So if I told you to take a deep breath, that's one thing that might produce relaxation. But what I've noticed over the years is that most people don't know how to take a deep breath. So the act of taking the deep breath, they use the wrong muscles and they get even tighter and it didn't work. So now coming back to your question of an example of sustainability would be there's a classic tennis drill called a six ball drill uh, where you, ha you give a child a deep corner ball on the deuce court and then a deep corner ball on the ad court and you do six of those. And usually by the sixth one, the, the child is panting. They're out of air. Um, and the purpose of the drill, as I understood it when I first saw it, was it's a really important shot to be able to take that deep corner ball and be able to put it back and play and get back, you know, where you might be able to take offense. You've got to learn how to hit that shot. 
And then you know, a lot of times it looked like it was being taught as a conditioning drill, but the approach to conditioning is not a sustainable approach to conditioning, which I'll come back to if you remind me or I remember. Okay. <laughs> I hear one of those. Um, <laughs> We're so, in trouble, think, Peter. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, exactly. Well, that happens. Um, so I'm, I have a little junior program that I've created because the single most important thing, I believe the single most important thing that we can teach our children is that, to, how to get the mind and the body to work together in harmony to get stuff done. And there was no program that I went to that was doing that. So I started a program for just a handful of kids where that was the primary focus and we did all the other stuff. So they knew about the space between the breath, the kids I teach. And I had just seen this six ball drill at one of the conferences I went to and I brought it back and went, this looks, it looked like a great drill to help them in with their games. And after about five minutes, one of the children came up to me and said, you know, Mr. Renner, this would be a lot more fun if everybody wasn't measuring their energy. And I said, what do you mean measuring their energy? He said, well, they're not trying for every ball. So I asked the kids, I said, you know, there was five on my court at the time. I said, how many of you are not trying for every ball? Everybody's hand went up, all five. I went, why? And they all like shrugged their shoulders. Like, I don't know. And then someone said, well, I mean, I guess because I want to be good on the last ball. I went, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, let's go back. Remember Telos or Telos. Uh, and uh, let's, let's do this drill differently. It's no longer a six ball drill. It's a deep corner ball drill. The purpose of the drill is going to be to learn how to hit the deep corner ball, and you're going to do it using the principles of Telos, the primary one. If you lose the space between the breaths, you feel it shorten. That's when you pause. Okay, everybody got it? Everybody's got it. Okay, good. You know, or if your legs, you know, if, if it's not you win, sometimes it's the legs. If, those, if you feel fatigue and the legs get tired, maybe you do one more ball or, you know, two more possibly, but then you pause there also. Okay, everybody agrees. First child does two balls and is winded. Second child does four balls, is winded. Third child does like 30-something balls before getting winded. Fourth child does like 20-something balls. Fifth child does 12, somewhere around 12, 13. Not one of them did six. The drill as I had designed it met no one's needs. I was either overworking two of the children or underworking the other three. And I realized in that moment, what, that was like a breakthrough moment in terms of applying telos to any drill in any program anywhere. That if this sustainability, sustainability being that the mind and the body are in harmony, if that's the primary, the top priority of anything they do, it changes the nature of it. But they also, it's our nature to grow. So if they do two balls today, but they're listening to their body and honoring their body and going to the edge of what their body can do, and that's the fundamental difference. So I'm going to pause there for a second. The fundamental difference between telos and the mainstream approach to conditioning and activity is where we draw the line. And I'm going to be more specific about that, and I'm going to use a, really a fitness and conditioning uh, model to explain it. So... Okay. Am I going too fast? No, this is great. Keep going. Okay. So now when I want to do something and I'm on the, you know, like say I'm on the treadmill and you go, there's like this effortless zone. The effortless zone is this wonderful area where the mind and the body are working together in harmony and everything is amazing. You know, you just feel energized and you feel focused and you feel dynamic and then you go a little further, and that's green. I make that green. We'll use the traffic light. And then you go a little further, and you get to yellow. Yellow is where fatigue happens. That's where the space between the breath is starting to shorten. That's where you might be starting to feel the legs a little. But it's, a little, it's only a little. And then you keep going through that, and you get to orange. And orange is exhaustion. Yellow turns to orange. That's exhaustion. And then after exhaustion, you get to red. And red is injury. It's breakdown. You either get sick or you get injured. So no one in today's training really wants to redline or very few want to go to that red line. But 
our approach to activity and our approach to doing stuff is that if you don't get to orange, you didn't try hard enough. You, I have 10 year olds who tell me in their swim practice, if they have any energy left at the end of swim practice, their coach makes them do exercises and, and yells at them for not giving their all on this particular day for measuring their energy. Now, interesting. I mean, that's such an interesting kind of um, light bulb moment, right? Oh, oh yeah. That this is this is, and I, I'm this is it. This is the fundamental difference. It's a light bulb moment. It and it requires, ironically. So I'll, let me add a little more to it. Is that now, what happens in Telos when you train? You train between green and yellow. So it doesn't mean, and this is what a misinterpretation of what I do, I'm not avoiding stress. I, yeah, when you get to the yellow, it's stressful. It's just not as stressful as orange. But growth takes place. The moment you go into the unknown, you go into that stress, things start to break down. When things start to break down, that's the catalyst for the growth. And then you go back. So the essence of telos is that I stress and recover in the moment. I have to have, my awareness has to be razor sharp so that I can see when the mind and body begin to separate and then just take a step back, reestablish my connection to being fully relaxed and fully engaged. And then I go forward again. It's my nature to grow. I'm just going to keep going into the unknown, keep going into the yellow, and then every time that happens, come back. And that's where the dialogue takes place, whereas the dialogue in mainstream takes place between the yellow and the orange. But the trouble with taking, doing your dialogue between the yellow and the orange is if you make a mistake, you're in red. You're injured. You're sick. And you don't even, usually don't know that it's a direct result of how you were training and doing stuff. Whereas if you make a mistake, make a mistake in telos, you're exhausted. So it requires a level of precision that I find captivating and most of the people I work with do as well. You have to be aware of the moment that the mind and the body begin to separate and then make the choice to bring them back together and do that over and over again as a process of natural growth that just has you over time sustainably building strength, conditioning, fitness, movement, technical skill, whatever it is that you want, homework, you know, I I work with CEOs, I work with golfers, I work with soccer players, I work with basketball players. It doesn't matter what it is. It applies to everything. It's a very, very simple process. The top priority, body, mind, harmony. The second thing is that you have to learn how to create and prioritize an agenda for the day, for the week, for the month, for the year. Start off for the day. And the third step is that when the two conflict, you let go of the agenda and return to body, mind, harmony. And that is the process that repeats endlessly on whatever it is that you want to become great at. So I come back to the six ball drill that I was telling you about. And all these kids marveled from that point. You know, we went to all different levels of conditioning, but they, they made the shot. They weren't, you know, they, they had the fine motor control to make the shot because they weren't going to the point where they were gassed. And in the program, so where I put my son, I put my son in all these programs that were the so-called great programs, and he would honor his mind-body connection, and basically the pros would punish him. Because if he stopped in the middle of a drill, he was setting a bad example. He was a slacker. Go do some push-ups. Go do some sit-ups. Go do some jumping jacks. What do you mean you're pausing? You, the coach looks over and sees you sitting down and resting. He thinks you're a slacker. So the coach is my passion, one of my great passions now. And the beauty of what I'm doing is because I don't teach technique, I don't really, I don't get in any problems with coaches who have programs. I teach sustainable optimum performance. I go in and now I have the people I've trained lots of pros to do it as well. They go into high performance programs and they observe, they get paid to observe the program. And then we get paid to show that program, how they can integrate sustainability into their program. We're simply the foundation for high performance. 
And that way we don't, we, we fit, we can fit in anywhere and anybody, we can put it in to any program that exists. Cause if you have progressions, you don't need to change your progressions. It's like, if you love the six ball drill, I'm not going to change the six ball drill. I am going to show you an approach to the six ball drill. That's going to get you more results. So and let perhaps, me play devil's advocate. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, it's all right. No, I was going to say, let me play devil's advocate for a second. I mean, this all sounds really phenomenal, but when you're in the middle of a match, you don't have the luxury of pausing when the mind-body connection separates. Correct. So, you know. So you better well, learn how to train. That's the whole thing. Remember I said it's all about progression. So I have it all the time. All the high-performance program goes, exactly what you said. You're not playing devil's advocate. Oh, well, maybe you are. But it's the same thing I hear every day, every time, whenever I introduce this. And they say that. I say, well, first of all, let's define fitness, okay? The definition of fitness, my general definition is, if you can do what you want to do without huffing and puffing, you're fit. Period. Now. Let's make it sport specific. In tennis, if I can fully recover physically, emotionally, and mentally in 25 seconds or less, I'm fit. In Grand Slams, I have to be able to recover in 20 seconds or less. Different level of fitness required for Grand Slams, not to mention more endurance. Okay, now, you talk about a match, but I said the foundation for moving forward is to be fully relaxed and fully engaged. And then you go step by step by step by step by step by step. And those steps lead from when you start off hitting that first ball at what I call gear one, or some people say 10% or some say 25, but a nice, easy ball, connect your breath to the act of hitting a ball and do it for 10, 15 minutes, establish gear one, that you can be fully relaxed and fully engaged in gear one. If you can't be consistent in gear one, you are not going to be consistent in any other gear. So gear one then gear two, then gear three, then gear four. Okay, now I'm fully warmed up. I'm fully relaxed. I'm fully engaged. Let's play, you know, let's play some points. But let's play points without keeping score because I'm trying to move through a clear progression where relaxation is the foundation and the essential ingredient for moving forward to the next step in the progression. So now I can warm up and play and get there and I can play points without scoring and I'm relaxed and I'm, everything's fine. And then all right, let's, let's keep score. Let's play points and just keep score. Okay, now, you know, you do that, and all of a sudden you start hearing if you're a college coach and you got your courts going, and one of the courts you start hearing, you know, the racket hit the ground or someone swearing, they're clearly not fully relaxed. So you go over there and you say, you know, why don't you go back to just uh, playing points without keeping score because you were fully relaxed there. It wasn't until we started playing points that you started to lose your relaxation. So let's go back and rather than figure it out and go through a whole mental thing, let's just go back and reestablish your connection to relaxation. And as soon as you're fully relaxed again, let's go forward and play points and keep score. That's where you are. That's your dialogue between the green and the yellow. That's where you are in your growth. You can stay relaxed all the way through the warm up and hitting and playing points. But when you start to play points and keep score, you get tight. So now you're just going to keep practicing between those two until all of a sudden you can play points and be loose. And then once you can do that, let's play a tiebreaker and see if you can stay loose. And if you can do that, let's get to playing a set. And then let's play two sets. And then let's play two out of three sets. So it's a level of mental, physical, and emotional conditioning where relaxation is the foundation of moving forward. And basically your question is based on the fact that all these kids, so far every single one that I have met, junior or college, not one of them is actually in condition to play a full tennis match. And we wonder why they get tight and they throw their rackets and they break down and they get upset. They're not in shape to do what it is they want to do. So, yes, is there a learning experience from that? Yeah, there's a great learning experience. Uh, uh, do I have time to tell you a short story? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got 10 minutes left, so. Okay, so I'll tell you a short it. story. I was teaching a 16-year-old boy who's a sectionally ranked player. He's in the top 50 good, solid player. He'd been working with me for six months. He came to me and he said, Mr. Renner, I know I have my agenda. I know what I want to do today. Okay. At this point, he understood the space between the breath. He understood how to connect his breath, breath to hitting the ball. He understood warming up through the gears. 
I've got an agenda. He was super excited because he had had trouble figuring out how to create and prioritize an agenda. He says, and, and he was like a choir boy, but he had the worst temper I've ever seen, but he never let it out. So he just always looked like he was going to blow up. So he comes to me, Mr. Renner, Mr. Renner, I know, I know exactly what I want to work on today. I said, oh, great. What do you, what's the agenda? He said, today, I'm not going to get angry. What do you think? I, you know, I had to take a deep breath on that one. And I said, I think <laughs> that's probably the most self-destructive goal you could have chosen. What? What do you mean self-destruct? What are you doing? I said, well, you and I both know you are going to get angry. And when you get angry, not only are you going to be mad, you're going to also have failed at your agenda. Okay, fine. Then what should my agenda be? And I don't know, but that's the right question. And then I thought about it. I thought, well, how about we make today that you become aware of the moment you get upset, that you become aware of maybe that moment that you're upset. And perhaps you even, you might become aware of why you're upset. Okay, I can do that. Okay, great. So we went through the warm up and we went through all the things. And we get to the point where we're playing points without keeping score because that's, it broke apart once, that's where things began to break apart. And we are, um, we, he plays a really beautiful point side to side. He gets me in one corner and the other corner, the other corner, he gets a short ball on the forehand for the forehand down the line approach, which will be a winner. And he drills it right into the top of the net. And you hear the sound of the ball snapping on the tape. And I thought he was going to break his racket over his knee. He was so mad. And he just, he was like, ah, oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's exactly it. That is what makes me crazy. I know how to construct a point. I set up the point, I get the shot to finish the point, and I always miss the shot. Okay. Um, do you have the space between your breath? What? Do you have the space between your breath? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Stop, takes a moment, looks in. No, I don't. Okay. Do you know where you lost? The space between the breath. What? Oh God. Oh. Um. Uh. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the wide, like four balls ago, when I had the, you hit that ball wide to my forehand, and I dug that out. That's probably where I lost the space. Okay. Well, there's an old Liberian proverb that I know that says, "Look not where you fell, but where you slipped." And. Uh. You know, and then, you know, explain like at that point, without the space, with a lack of oxygen, one is going to choke. One loses fine motor control. That is the reality, the physiological reality that happens when the body is denied oxygen. So by the fourth ball, you're going to be less precise. Okay. Um, you know, lesson's over. And then he goes to, I see him, he plays in this program, a program in Connecticut where I live that's considered, it's a very competitive program. They do what's called up-down courts. They have six courts and mm -hmm. you basically play for an hour. Whoever has the most points moves up a court. The least points moves down a court. The other two stay in the middle. And he plays in this program. And my son was playing in the program at the time as well. And uh, I came in the door and I saw him and he's smiling ear to ear. And he goes, Mr. Renner, Mr. Renner, Mr. Renner, you're not going to believe what happened. I was like, oh yeah, what happened? What happened? What happened? Says, I ended up the number one player on the number one court. That's never happened before. I go, wow, congratulations. No, 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 but that's not the amazing thing about what happened. I said, okay, well, what, what's the amazing thing? He said, how I got there. How'd you get there? He goes, all right. I showed up for the tennis today, and I decided that my agenda was going to be that I was going to notice when I lost the space between the breath. If I lost the space between the breath, I was just going to let someone take my turn. So that I was never going to play a point unless I had the space between my breath. Oh. Cool. So, yeah. And he goes, and like every 10 points, I probably gave my turn away like three, four times at least. And everybody was looking at me like I was nuts, but I never lost a point. So I won the court by like eight, nine points, even though I gave away three or four points a game, who let other people play. And I, then I was like, Oh wow. That, that is, that's really, that is amazing. I, I, as a coach, you can imagine, I like that moment. 
He goes, but that's not the most amazing moment. I said, well, for me, that was pretty amazing, but okay, what was the most amazing moment? He said, the most amazing thing is that I realized that if I have to give away three or four points out of every 10 points because I'm out of breath, I'm not fit to play a competitive tennis match. That's what I do. Because when he comes to that awareness, I don't have to teach him or motivate him. I have never found anyone who's not motivated. They're all motivated. The problem is they can't process. They've got all this information, all this technique. Uh, you know, the, my story on the tail end of that is just that I, I tell these kids, I say, look, you already have enough information to win matches at Wimbledon. And they, they laugh. And I go, no, you do. And I know, I know I do because I've won matches at Wimbledon with my left hand. But when I play with my right hand, I can't win a point off you. And I have the exact same amount of information. So optimum performance is not about how much information I have. It's about my ability to process the information and express it through my body. And Telos does that. Awesome. 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 So if my listeners want to get more information about Telos and you, Peter Renner, how do they do that? How do they find you? I think the best, approach right now for that would be to email me at peter at telos t-e-l-o-s dot today simple enough yeah and is your website live is there information it's online not really, they can get, know, or? It's like most people the website is it's going under a major reconstruction because things have shifted Recently, I've started training many more pros and I've started a tennis management company where the pros who I train are now going into resorts around the world and um, running the Telos tennis program at those resorts. Like now there's a place in Turks and Caicos called Amanyara where they run my resort and, and in Thailand and Barbuda, and the Dominican, there's a lot of places that are uh, up and going and, and focusing on that. I realized my website has to go to another level. So it's under construction. I know it's a common term, uh, but I hope to have it done. It seems to take a while to do websites. So I guess within six months, I would say it will be up and fully functional, hopefully a lot less. But meanwhile, but they can reach you at peter at telos dot today. That's the best. That would be the best way if they want more information um, or they have any questions for me. That would be uh, the best way to reach me for today. Perfect. And, you, and you're also on Facebook, so, um, you know, people can find you there as well. Um, I, I think it's fascinating what you're doing. And, you know, I my listeners know because I talk about it a lot, but I do a lot of yoga, and part of yoga is breath work, and I do a lot of breath work. And I'm a firm believer in that whole idea of noticing the pause, honoring the pause, and noticing when it's not there and getting back to that type of breath to stay calm and present and aware. And uh, I I think it's very interesting to see how you're using these very old skills. I mean, this is nothing new. This is, you know, a practice that's been going on for. It's not the, it's just put together little pieces of old things that came together just really to rebuild my life. And it turned out that it had a broader application. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Well, to my listeners, I urge y'all to reach out to Peter and, you know, learn more about what he's doing. And, you know, it's a, even if it doesn't, help your child in tennis it will help them in life <laughs> so well, that um, is, that, this is thank a, you lisa that is the goal the idea is that like we have a choice we can master something in an enjoyable way or we could master something in an unenjoyable way i prefer to master something in an enjoyable way uh, amen and let's close with that peter thank you so much for joining me today and to my listeners hope you enjoyed hearing from peter He's always a fascinating person to to conversate with. So I, I hope we'll get get you back on the show again in the future. Thanks for being with us, Peter, and we'll see you next week on Parenting Aces.
Well, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone, for listening.